Now we come to 16, chapter 16, uh, Kasapa Sangyutta. This course is concerned with Venerable Kasapa, the ascetic Arahanda. 16.1, the Savati, the Buddha said, Monks, this Kasapa is content with any kind of robe, and he speaks in praise of contentment with any kind of robe, and he does not engage in a wrong search in what is improper for the sake of a robe, if he does not get a robe, he is not agitated, and if, and if he gets one, he uses it without being tied to it, uninfatuated with it, not blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it, understanding the escape. Monks, this kasapa is content with any kind of arms food, with any kind of lodging, with any kind of medicines. If he gets them, he uses them without being tied to them, uninfatuated with them, not blindly absorbed in them seeing the danger in them, understanding the escape. Stop here for a moment. Here the Buddha is talking about the four requisites, the four essentials of a monk. is the robe, food, lodging, and medicines. So the Buddha says, Kasapa, if he gets them, okay. If he doesn't get them, also okay. Therefore, monks, you should train yourselves thus. We will be content with any kind of robe, and we will speak in praise of contentment with any kind of robe, and we will not engage in a wrong search in what is improper for the sake of a robe. If we do not get a robe, we will not be agitated, and if we get one, we will use it without being tied to it, uninfatuated with it, not blindly absorbed in it, seeing the danger in it, understanding the escape. Similarly, we will be content with any kind of arms, food, lodging, medicines, etc. Monks, I will exhort you by the example of Kasapa, or one who is similar to Kasapa. Being exhorted, you should practice accordingly. It's the end of the sutta. So here, uh, the Buddha has a lot of respect for Kasapa and holds him as a standard and uh, the model uh, for other monks uh, and asking other monks uh, to follow him. Uh, to practice contentment like him. 16.2 On one occasion, the Venerable Maha Kasapa and the Venerable Sariputta were dwelling at Varanasi in the deer park at Isipatana. Then in the evening, the Venerable Sariputta emerged from seclusion and approached the Venerable Maha Kasapa. He exchanged greetings with the Venerable, with the Venerable Maha Kasapa. And we, when, when they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side. Stop here for a moment. You see, uh, during the Buddha's days, uh, the monks, uh, in the morning, they go on arms round. After arms round, they come back and they eat their food. Uh, sometimes either they live together or they live close to each other. And uh, after they have eaten their food, uh, if there's any remainder, uh, they will leave it uh, for others uh, in case the others uh, did not get enough food to eat. Uh, and the Buddha allowed them other monks uh, to eat the leftovers of the other monks uh, as long as it had not passed noon, uh, not passed the time when the sun was the highest. Uh. Then uh, after eating the food, uh, the monks will go and find a quiet place uh, to meditate uh, for the rest of the day uh, until the sun sets. Uh. Then when the sun sets, uh, they will go to usually the most senior monk uh, and uh, discuss Dhamma. So here, actually, you see, um, Venerable Sariputta is the right-hand disciple of the Buddha. Venerable Sariputta, uh, Venerable Mahamoglana is the left-hand uh, disciple of the Buddha. This, these two uh, sit next to the Buddha. But actually, they were not the most senior. Uh, they were already more than uh, more than a thousand uh, uh, disciples of the Buddha, more than a thousand arahans uh, before Venerable Sariputta and Mughalana came. La. And, uh, but here you see, uh, uh, Venerable Sariputta in the evening, uh, he went to look for Venerable Mahakasapa. It was not the other way around. Uh. So even though he was considered uh, like the Tasus uh, Yung, the, 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 the eldest, eldest disciple, uh, and yet uh, he went to look for Mahakasapa because uh, for two reasons. La. One is probably Mahakasapa uh, was more senior to him, la, became a disciple of the Buddha before him. La. Secondly, uh, Mahakasapa was 
most probably uh, much older than him. Venerable Maha Kasapa was even older than the Buddha. So, and also because Venerable Maha Kasapa was such an ascetic monk, uh, so uh, strict, uh, that uh, all the monks respected him. Uh, so, Venerable Sariputta also out of respect uh, went to see him. Uh. Venerable Sariputta said, Friend, this Abuso, uh, it is said that one who is not ardent and who is unafraid of wrongdoing is incapable of enlightenment, incapable of Nibbana, incapable of achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. But one who is ardent and afraid of wrongdoing is capable of enlightenment, capable of Nibbana, capable of achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. In what way is this so, friend? So here, Venerable Sariputta is asking him a Dhamma, Dhamma question. Huh? And, um, Mahakasapa said, Dear friend, a monk does not arouse harder by thinking. If unarisen evil and wholesome states arise in me, this may lead to my harm. Nor by thinking, if evil and wholesome states that have arisen in me are not abandoned, this may lead to my harm. Nor by thinking, if unarisen wholesome states do not arise in me, this may lead to my harm. Nor by thinking, if wholesome states that have arisen in me cease, this may lead to my harm. Thus he is not ardent. Stop here for a moment. So here where Mahakasapa says, a monk is not diligent, not energetic, if he does not consider these four things. If unarisen evil and wholesome states arise in me, this may lead to my harm. Uh, if evil and wholesome states that have arisen are not abandoned, this may lead to my harm, etc. These four things uh, are called the four right efforts. It is, uh, let me see, the, the fifth factor, the sixth factor of the sixth factor of the noble eightfold path. Uh. Right effort leads to right recollection, sati, uh, and we shall read to right concentration. So. Uh, so this uh, right effort uh, is, firstly, uh, if unwholesome states uh, have not arisen, uh, that have not arisen, uh, arise, uh, uh, then this is bad. Uh. And unwholesome states, uh, if they arise, uh, they, when they arise, they are not abandoned, uh, then also this is harmful. Uh. And wholesome states, uh, if they have not arisen, uh, and they do not arise. Huh? This also is no good. If wholesome states have ar- that have arisen huh? cease, huh? this is also no good. Huh? And how, friend, is he unafraid of wrongdoing? Here, friend, a monk does not become afraid at the thought. If unarisen evil wholesome states arise in me, this may lead to my harm. Or evil, or if evil unwholesome states that have arisen in me are not abandoned. This may lead to my harm, etc. It is in this way, friend, that one who is not ardent and who is unafraid of wrongdoing is incapable of enlightenment, incapable of nibbana, incapable of achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. Stop here for a moment. So here, uh, Mahakasapa is saying, a uh, monk uh, who is not diligent, uh, he does not observe his own mind. Uh, we have to constantly observe our mind uh, to see whether there are wholesome or unwholesome states in our mind. Uh. Uh, if there are unwholesome states, uh, we should get rid of them quickly. Uh. Uh, if there are wholesome states, uh, then we should prolong them uh, or make them uh, rise. Uh, rise uh. Uh. And how, friend, is one ardent? Dear friend, a monk arouses ardor by thinking. If unarisen, Evil wholesome states arise in me, this may lead to my harm. Or, and by thinking, if evil and wholesome states that have arisen in me are not abandoned, this may lead to my harm. And he also thinks, if unarisen wholesome states do not arise in me, this may lead to my harm. And he also thinks, if wholesome states that have arisen in me cease, this may lead to my harm. Thus he is ardent. And how, friend, is he afraid of wrongdoing? Dear friend, a monk becomes afraid at the thought. Similarly, that's the same uh, four thoughts. Uh. It is in this way, friend, that one who is ardent and afraid of wrongdoing is capable of enlightenment, capable of nibbana, capable of achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage. So, 
you see these four, four considerations are very important. Uh, the the Mahakasapa is saying, uh, if you don't, do not practice this, uh, you cannot be released from samsara. A lot of people, uh, they practice meditation, uh, they want to achieve this state and achieve that state, uh, but they don't observe themselves. Uh. It's very important here uh, to observe yourself, uh, observe your mind. Don't observe other people's mind. Uh. <laughs> it's a very common habit uh, to look at other people uh, and criticize other people. Uh. Uh, you don't see your own faults. Uh. When we practice a uh, spiritual path, uh, we must always look within and uh, look outside. Uh. 16, 16 point. Three, at Savati. Monks, you should approach families like the moon, drawing back the body and mind, always acting like newcomers, without impudence towards families. Just as a man looking down an old well, a precipice, or a steep river bank, would draw back the body and mind, so too monks should you approach families. I'll stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, uh, monks, uh, how they should behave uh, towards lay people, uh, families. Uh. The Buddha is saying, uh, monks should not be too familiar with lay people, uh, drawing back the body and mind, uh, always acting like newcomers, uh, uh, without impudence, without being proud, uh, arrogant. Uh. should realize the danger uh, of associating too much with lay people. Uh. Uh, that's why you should draw back as though from a well uh, or a precipice. Uh. Uh, so the Buddha said, uh, approach families like the moon. The moon uh, uh, is always hiding beca- behind the clouds. Uh. So uh, uh, monks uh, also should not uh, mix too much with lay people, uh, uh, but uh, hide in the in the forest. Uh. Once in a while you come out uh, like the moon, uh, but then uh, other times uh, to hide uh, behind the clouds. Uh. Monks. Kasapa approaches families like the moon, drawing back the body and mind, always acting like a newcomer, without impudence towards families. What do you think, monks? What kind of monk is worthy to approach families? Remember, sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, take recourse in the Blessed One. It would be good if the Blessed One would clear up the meaning of this statement. Having heard it from him, the monks will remember it. Then the Blessed One waved his hand in space and said, Monks, just as this hand does not get caught in space, is not held fast by it, is not bound by it, so when a monk approaches families, his mind does not get caught, held fast and bound amidst families, thinking, may those desiring gains acquire gains, may those desiring merits make merits. He is as elated and happy over the gains of others as he is over his own gains. Such a monk is worthy to approach families. Monks, When Kasapa approaches families, his mind does not get caught, held fast, or bound amidst families, thinking, may those desiring gains acquire gains, may those desiring merits make merits. He is as elated and happy over the gains of others as he is over his own gains. What do you think, monks? How is a monk's teaching of the Dhamma impure? And how is his teaching of the Dhamma pure? Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, etc. Then listen and attend closely, monks, I will speak. Yes, Venerable Sir, those monks replied. The Blessed One said this, A monk teaches the Dhamma to others with the thought, Oh, may they listen to the Dhamma from me. Having listened, may they gain confidence in the Dhamma. Being confident, may they show their confidence to me. Such a monk's teaching of the Dhamma is impure. But a monk teaches the Dhamma to others with the thought, This Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. Oh, may they listen to the Dhamma from me. Having listened, may they understand the Dhamma. Having understood, may they practice accordingly. Thus he teaches the Dhamma to others, cause of the intrinsic excellence of the Dhamma. He teaches the Dhamma to others from compassion and sympathy, out of tender concern. Such a monk's teaching of the Dhamma is pure. Monks, Kasapa teaches the, the Dhamma to others with the thought. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, directly visible, immediate, etc. May they listen, may they listen to the Dhamma from me. Having listened, may they understand the Dhamma. Having understood, may they practice accordingly. So, he teaches the Dhamma to others because of the intrinsic excellence of the Dhamma. He teaches the Dhamma to others from compassion and sympathy out of tender concern. Monks, 
I will exhort you by the example of Kasapa, or one who is similar to Kasapa. Being exhorted, you should practice accordingly. That's the end of the sutta. So, finally, the Buddha says uh, that a monk teaches the Dhamma not to be famous or uh, to get a lot of offerings, uh, but out of compassion for others uh, and to make others see uh, how excellent uh, is the Buddha's Dhamma, how helpful it is for us uh, to lessen our suffering uh, and to attain happiness uh, in this life and future lifetimes. It's about an hour, so I'll stop here for the moment uh, and continue tomorrow. If anything to discuss, you can discuss. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, if you look at other people's fault, uh, if we want to say anything, uh, we have to uh, be very clear of our intentions. Uh. If our intentions are to help the other person, uh, it's okay. Uh. It's okay if we, if we speak uh, to help the other person. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they don't see their faults. Uh. But then we also have to use our wisdom. Uh. You have to see whether that person uh, will accept your criticism or not, will accept your advice or not. If that person will not accept, uh, and it is uh, not worthwhile to speak to him. The Buddha says, uh, when we speak, uh, the speech uh, should have a few qualities, like good speech. Uh, one is, uh, uh, it should be truthful. Uh, the one, uh, it should be motivated by kindness or compassion. Then we should speak gently, uh, and uh, we should speak at the right time. Uh, and we should speak words that are beneficial. Uh, uh, these are the qualities uh, of good speech. Uh, so when we try to advise somebody or so, uh, we try to see, uh, to speak that way. Uh. And if we are criticized by others, uh, it is uh, good uh, to examine ourselves uh, and see uh, whether uh, it is true or not. Uh. If somebody does criticize us, uh, even if it's not 100% true, it uh, uh, should be a little, a little truth in it. Uh. <laughs> but the problem is uh, if we don't uh, learn the Dhamma for most ordinary people, uh, when they get criticism, uh, they flare up in a rage. Uh. A lot of people uh, will not accept criticism. So that is the whirling, uh, the putujana, the ordinary man in the street, uh, person who is walking the spiritual path, uh, should be dif- different uh, if, uh, if we uh, criticize. Uh, um, actually, it is good for us uh, sometimes. Uh, just like medicine, uh, medicine uh, is bitter to the taste. Uh, but it is it is good for 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 us. Uh, so in the same way, sometimes uh, words of criticism, uh, it, 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 we don't like to listen. Uh, but uh, it's good for us uh, because uh, we will improve much faster uh, if people criticize us. Uh, so the Buddha says in the suttas, uh, if you have a teacher uh, who is willing to point out your faults, uh, uh, you should not run away from him. Uh, you should stay with him for the rest of your life. <laughs> Hard to find a teacher uh, who is bothered to look, to, to pinpoint your, your faults. Uh. But some, very often, uh, the teacher does not do it uh, because the disciple uh, will not listen. <laughs>
probably stop here for tonight. We have to do some work with John.